Now today we're very fortunate in having Emmanuel Carter, who's from the Landscape Architecture Department here. And they often are very strongly focused on environment. Now, environment here means several things. Environment means clean environment, ecology, and all of that stuff. And it also means a good environment in which people live and work. And Emmanuel grew up in Philadelphia, went to Cornell, uh, has a master's degree in government and what? Uh, bachelor's in government, master's in city planning. Master's? Oh, two masters. No, no. Bachelor's in government. Bachelor's in government, city master's city. in city planning. And I'm going to turn it over to him. And uh, he's a very interesting speaker. And he's right up here. If you are interested in this, I'm sure he'd be happy to have you come and find out what you might do to major in something related to what he's talking about. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to um, initiate a discussion today that talks about the relationship of human settlement patterns and sustainable environments. Um, I think, as, you know, as Charlie has already indicated, and then you probably uh, uh, intuitively discovered on your own, uh, that there's a direct relationship between the overall quality of, uh, of a region, in terms of sustainability and environmental quality, and how we handle human settlement patterns. Uh, you know, we can study you know, what, the, what is necessary in a healthy uh, uh, ecosystem for fish, for beavers, for birds, and uh, various creatures of that sort. But uh, the most demanding creatures on the planet, in fact, are us. Okay? Uh, we don't simply need to find a place where we have uh, food and protection and opportunities to procreate. Uh, being humans and being self-conscious, we also need to be pleased, which is an incredible requirement to fill. Okay? Uh, you know, we need to know that we are happy, glad to be where we are. We have to consciously invest in a place. And if we can't do that, then we tend to throw that place away and move on to another location and try to be pleased there. And as a result, uh, you know, the land use requirements that we as an animal have far outstrip those of any other kind of creature that you're going to, uh, to study while you're here or at any other time in your lifetime. Um, there has come to be a growing congruence, fortunately, between the environmental sciences and the, uh, the arts of design and planning in understanding how we have to manage human settlement patterns in order to have a sustainable sense of community and place. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to explain to you a bit about how the kinds of communities that we have today came to be this way, and then uh, what some places are doing about uh, changing the current condition. How many of you like the environments that you see in the United States today? How many of you think that they are uh, pleasant, efficient, um, so aesthetic, built pleasing. environments or natural environments? Built environments. How many of you think that they are pleasant environments? Okay, how many of you think that they are not pleasant environments? Okay, and how many of you have, uh, are sort of on the line, aren't quite sure what you think of them? All right, okay. Um, we'll see if we can get a different proportion of, of hands as we move through, through this period. Um, I think it is fair to say that most of our landscapes, uh, and by which I mean all of our human settlement patterns, everything that we touch, are essentially unsustainable <coughs> landscapes. All right? uh, now, maybe I should go back and give a definition of what I think sustainable means, and then, uh, because we have a lot of talk about uh, sustainability without defining it. Um, sooner or later, you're going to run into somebody on this campus who's going to talk to you about a shifting steady state mosaic. Uh, looking at ecosystem as a shifting steady state mosaic. And what that means is that there's basically a constant amount of energy and matter that, uh, that varies in what it specifically is, but, basic, but, but it's a healthy interaction uh, that is resilient and there's an equilibrium within that environment uh, and, uh, and, and it supports life okay, and the evolution of life. So a sustainable city or a sustainable human settlement pattern is essentially a healthy, shifting, steady state mosaic of life, activity, and processes. And for a human settlement pattern to, to be healthy, it has the exact same requirements as any natural ecosystem. I will get very specific about that uh, very shortly. Let me get some of the um, slides going. Many of us are used to the idea, in fact it is a conventional wisdom in the United States, that cities are inherently unsound. 
How many of you think of cities as places you don't want to be? Okay. Um, how many of you think of cities as places you do want to be? All right, that's about half and half, okay? Um, but I think if you, look, if you look at the landscapes we've built, there's a general assumption nationwide that cities are unsound. That's why you have so much suburbanization. Uh, there are many people who actually will say to you face to face, I wouldn't put dead in, you know, pick the city of your choice, Chicago, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, whatever. Uh, and uh, cities are often associated with uh, problems of poor school districts, uh, problems of crime, problems of neighborhood decay, uh, any number of other problems that come from either being underfunded or uh, beset by uh, large populations that require uh, the support of social services and, uh, you know, situations like that. In every other part of the world, cities are actually much more sound. They are the place to be. They are the symbols of the culture. And the reason that that is not the case here is because we have an ambivalence about cities. All right, uh, and this goes back historically to a time of uh, uh, post-American Revolution discussion between Thomas Jefferson and uh, Alexander Hamilton. But Thomas Jefferson's attitude was that the new nation was going to have to be an agrarian nation. Uh, that the agricultural economy was the kind of thing that, first of all, kept full employment uh, and uh, everybody was therefore occupied with something to do. Alexander Hamilton's attitude was that no empire of that time frame, meaning the end of the 1700s, could be carried uh, ahead without a, a strong industrial base and that you needed an urban nation in order for that to happen. Ever since that time, uh, given the course of empire, if you will, across the, the North American continent, that debate has continued to rage. Uh, many people have always found that a sense of renewal has come by going out into the rural landscape and, uh, uh, and, and living the rural life. On the other hand, uh, as that empire grew uh, and became increasingly strong, it was in fact the industrial <coughs> cities that made it a global power. Uh, we're still ambivalent about being a global power based on industry versus being people who want to live out in a, in, in a rural scenario. Um, we had an opportunity uh, in the 1930s to actually uh, act on uh, our, our belief that, more, that fewer people should be living in cities. And I'll get to that and show you what kinds of things that that has resulted in. Well, I'll start right now. Uh, many of us, when we think about what cities are, think about situations like this, all right? Um, this is what used to be a viable neighborhood with virtually every uh, parcel filled with housing or commercial development. Uh, this obviously is an area of disinvestment. Um, we think of, we look at areas like this, you know, uh, you know, uh, overgrowth in uh, places where there used to be houses, rundown uh, housing uh, in old dense communities. Uh, these are some of our, you know, our negative views of what cities are. You know, situations like this, um, you know, where there once was something thriving, it's now decayed, and it's decayed because again, there's been a conventional wisdom that this isn't how we want to live or need to live. Um, our downtowns, instead of having the old department stores, the skyscrapers, the dense commercial development, uh, the lawyers and the accountants and all those other things that made a downtown work, now becomes a matter of big box retail. It doesn't make any difference whether it's Walmart or Target or BJ's or anything of that sort. Um, and it's temporary, okay? Um, cities used to be built uh, to last forever, all right? Uh, even as late as the 1920s, what we built in cities was kind of as Hannibal said when he got into Italy uh, during the Second Punic War. He said uh, he was amazed by what he saw because he says the Romans design as if they're going to be here forever. Uh, and he was incredibly impressed by that. Uh, uh, we designed actually for about a 20 year time frame. This building will not outlast the business plan for getting their money back. All right? So the assumption is that in fact this building will be uh, beyond repair in a 20 year frame. That's how we deal with cities, so we're likely do we take them as environments, all right? Well, we make other kinds of decisions. This is a village in the Shenandoah Valley uh, where the highway engineers have uh, taken sway. They widened Route 11 to allow trucking off of 81 out into the villages. Well, when you do this kind of thing, what happens? If you walk off of this porch or that porch, you are in the moving lane, all right? So they've destroyed this village, all right? Whoever owns this house has got to be elderly. And when they die, they cannot give the place away. But that's an indication, again, of how much we've decided to, uh, to walk away from the investment in uh, our concept of city, by which I include hamlet and village. Okay, those are urban situations. 
Uh, we've walked away from downtown retail, and uh, you can see where there was an attempt to modernize it, to put new signage on 19th century buildings to make it look as if it was modern, probably something done in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it didn't work. Right? Um, we get the idea that this is perhaps a preferred landscape, and increasingly an urban landscape. This is within the city of Watertown, out near the city line. Uh, and you drive to everything, and when you finish driving uh, to where you're going and you're ready to come out, you then come out in such a way as to cause an accident. There was a lot of middle fingers and the honking of horns uh, that were the result of this sort of uh, situation here. But we take this as, as normal. Uh, we replace a lot of our abandoned cityscape with public housing. Some of it is absolutely horrible and uh, 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 life-threatening. Sometimes it's in a format like this where there's actually a certain sense of close-knit community, but it isn't what we really prefer to be living in. And we get downtowns that begin to look like this. Uh, you know, <coughs> there are other photos of Syracuse that show downtown where every parcel is built on. Now people are saying downtown, well, there's plenty of places to park. Any downtown that in fact has plenty of places to park is not working. A good downtown should not have plenty of places to park. It should have bus stops, subway stations, trolley car stops, and there should be a critical mass of people for whom what is happening down here commercially, that's their nearest commercial district. They live there. There should be tens of thousands of people that live in viable downtowns. If you're in New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, that is demonstrably the case, and that's why their downtowns work. New York, of course, has several downtowns. Um, Chicago, maybe uh, a, a couple, Philadelphia, one, in the sense that we think of it as a as the, as center city. Okay. Uh, another view of, um, uh, of, of downtown Syracuse. Again, look at all that surface parking. That is a sign that we have walked away from the concept of city. Now, the question you want to ask yourself is, where did these people go? All right? If we walk away from city, uh, where do they go? And what they do is they go out into the rural landscape. Right? We've had a lot of talk over the last 40 years about the fact that cities have been abandoned and that people have gone to the suburbs. What we really should be saying is that people actually went to the rural landscape. Most suburbs were once agricultural or forested communities in the Northeast. And that all had to be destroyed and rearranged in order to get <coughs> subdivisions out there on them. Okay? So uh, they didn't go to a blank slate. They went to something they had to systematically <coughs> destroy in order to build suburbs. Uh, another view of uh, uh, the, the Gateway District, uh, part of Syracuse's south side. Okay, uh, we also find ourselves doing weird things as we abandon cities and, uh, and go out of the rural landscape. We start to do things that are very incoherent. Uh, can you imagine the large helicopters that had to come in and just sort of <coughs> drop this down onto that agricultural landscape to make this kind of thing happen? Uh, you know, those who, well, none of you were alive during the Vietnam War, probably, but, uh, you know, you can imagine helicopters coming into Kamran Bay and making an instant army base. You know, you do it like this, you just drop it down on the landscape. There's no, there's no sense of streets, uh, no coherent cityscape, nothing to knit this together. You can get in your car, and you can drive out of there, but you can't do anything there, and you wouldn't want to, right? So we not only have abandoned the cities, we've actually made things out of the suburban locations that we don't want to be in either. And in fact, we now have a situation where many Americans don't want to be anywhere, right? which is why we uh, move so often. Uh, you know, another example, uh, you know, out on the rural landscape, you know, you begin to get property owners who think that this is an okay thing to do. You know, we're all we're very aware of urban trash and urban ghettos, but you know, same stuff, right? You just have more space to play with. Uh, or we get massive threats like this: Pearl Street Mini Storage is going to come out to this farmland. This is out near Watertown. Uh, and what they're going to do is make these boxes that sit in rows and they're going to have all of the junk that the suburbanites own and can't fit in their basement, their attic, or in that little barn structure you buy from Sears uh, that you keep in the backyard. Uh, you know, we get all your junk now is going to go out the Pearl Street mini storage because we have too much stuff and we can't handle it all. So we store it out on the rural landscape. Now how do we get to be that way? Very simply, we did it by conscious federal policy. Um, up through the 1930s, uh, by the way, who knows when the Depression began? Yeah, 1929, okay? It really went right up into the beginning of the Second World War. Um, Franklin Roosevelt uh, desperately needed to find a way to get the economy going during his, in, in the early years of the administration. 
One of the techniques that he chose was to change the way in which the mortgage system works. A mortgage up until, 19, up until the 1930s uh, was a system in which you bought a piece of property by putting 50% of the cost down, uh, uh, and then the bank gave you a mortgage for five years to amortize the rest of the, uh, of, of the costs. At the end of five years, the bank called in the mortgage and you paid off or you uh, were in default. What Roosevelt wanted to do was get a lot more people participating in this mortgage system, and the way he did it was he agreed to tell the banks that, that every bank mortgage loan made would be backed by the federal government. So if there's a default on the loan, the federal government would make good on that loan to the bank. That allowed the banks to say, well, okay, then we'll give mortgages over a 20 to 30 year period, and you put 5% down or 10% down, and then you amortize the rest over, over that longer period. Long-term risk for the bank, but not if the federal government is going to, in fact, uh, back up those, uh, any possible defaults. Immediately, the federal government realized it could not really, in fact, back every mortgage offered coast to coast. So they had to decide where they would and where they would not. So through an organization called the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation, the federal government sent teams out, teams of lawyers, realtors, and uh, uh, I guess the primary lawyers, lawyers and realtors, out to every single city in the United States, okay, from the northern tip of Maine all the way out to the coast of California, and they drew maps of these cities, and using these maps to determine where they would back mortgages and where they would not. There were four categories uh, of color on these maps. Every area that got colored green was eligible for 100% federal backing for a mortgage. Every area colored blue was eligible for 85% backing for uh, federal backing for a mortgage. Then there was this incredible drop off. Every area colored yellow was eligible for 15, 1 5, 15% backing, uh, federal backing for a mortgage. And every area colored red was eligible for no federal backing for a mortgage at all. With that, basically about 60% of America's urban landscape was rendered untenable they could not get federal backing for a mortgage. So even if you had money and took care of your property and you wanted to reinvest with it, with it by remortgaging your property, the bank wouldn't touch it because you were in a red or yellow zone. And, and yellow was so low in the amount of federal backing you could get that all yellow de facto eventually became red in its behavior. Now, what were the criteria for that? And this is a you know, pretty nefarious kind of uh, thing to tell people, but the fact is, is that there were two very ugly criteria. Uh, the first was that the federal government would not agree to back, to, uh, to, to back bank mortgages in any area where there was deteriorated housing stock or in general deteriorated building stock. Now when these maps were made in 1936 and 1937, we were up to eight years into the depression. So a lot of building stock had had no private reinvestment and no public reinvestment uh, over the previous eight years. The money simply wasn't there. So a lot of America was languishing in terms of built form, the condition of built form. But any area that had what was considered serious deterioration would not get federally backed mortgages. The second criteria was that any area that had an inf a presence of or an influx of people who were black, Jewish, or foreign born white would not get federally backed mortgages uh, to assist with reinvestment. Now, all of you who have Greek, Italian, Polish, Russian, German, uh, uh, Filipino, Hispanic, or other kinds of names can understand that that meant you, okay? As well as me and some other people who maybe can't tell what they are, uh, they just go to synagogues, all right? Uh, so, given the nature of the American population, what that uh, decision did was it just simply said, we're going to write that population off. And, uh, and, and, I, and I have the words that were used on the evaluation forms where they refer to real Americans, that means uh, Anglo-German Americans, uh, and they were okay, all right? Uh, and they tended to get the blue and the, uh, uh, and, and the green neighborhoods. So uh, if you think that in fact, uh, when you look at our cityscapes and how they've been treated, and you look at the idea that cities have been kind of written off, and you think this is someone's <laughs> fault, the answer is yes, it is. It's very specifically someone's fault, and it's the staff of the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation operating under the Franklin Roosevelt administration. Now, unfortunately, all those people are dead. Otherwise, we could make them live in red neighborhoods. Okay, that would be the sentence that they would get from federal courts these days. 
Uh, but what we can do is use this as a way to gain some perspective on why we have the least sustainable human settlement patterns on the planet. Why we use more energy and more acreage per person than any other culture on the planet. And why we think it's okay to do that because we're several generations into thinking that this is normal behavior. And we are, in fact, systematically ruining the environment that we live in by behaving this way. This is, by the way, the city of Philadelphia. You can see the percentage that got red and yellow. And uh, you can see why the city has had to struggle like crazy in order to come back, which it, by the way, has. Uh, this is uh, some of the suburban district uh, west of the city on what's called the main line. Uh, and that got mostly blue and green. Uh, but it was also an invasion of agricultural and forested lands. Now this is something you might be more familiar with. This is the city of Syracuse. Uh, when you move around in the city of Syracuse and wonder how did that neighborhood begin to decline the way it did, uh, what is wrong with our downtown, and so on, look at the percentage of the city that was colored yellow and red, and therefore rendered untenable uh, by the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 1930s. Right? So, and, and many of the people who live there and have continued to live there, they pass down to their children that this was done to us. And so their children grow up feeling like, okay, there's a them and an us in the United States, and then they behave, begin to behave accordingly and uh, don't believe in a lot of what we say about the opportunities for moving ahead. Including right here, right? Including? Right. I, where are we right now? We are in this blue oh, area. Oh, I see. Oh, right I here. I'm sorry. This is, yeah, we're literally right there. They didn't color in the university and the, and the um, uh, Oakwood Cemetery, right? And we're right here on this side of the dome. Okay. But right down here is, uh, you know, 81 comes right through here, all right? And right down here is uh, Pioneer Homes. Uh, much of Syracuse's South Brighton district, uh, South Side, uh, the, the near West Side community, um, parts of the North Side, uh, you know, heading up toward the lakefront. Okay, and this became the landscape that became acceptable. Right? Um, and this is kind of, you know, uh, this is actually a 1950s uh, version uh, of, what, of what was the, uh, the coming thing. And you see, the new subdivision is, uh, you know, the early version of the mall, and there's some apartment housing, and there's a school over there. Um, and there's the implication that there was once a forest there. Uh, in fact, what's interesting is this is literally in the city limits in Philadelphia, in an area that had not been developed until after the Second World War. Uh, and in order to compete with the suburbs, they actually designed this area to be much like the suburbs. And again, if you look at the amount of energy and acreage per person, you know, that's not a very dense development. And they chopped down a lot of acreage of forest in order to make that happen. That was all in city forest uh, that was there. And you begin to get this when you, live, when you get up close to it, all right? And one of the things that's fascinating about this is that as we thought we were advancing the nature of our environments, we actually settled for a lower standard. Uh, you know, there are no street trees here, and there's no sidewalk. And in fact, actually, we were in a community that was becoming increasingly privatized. Automobiles, earphones, nowadays computers in the basement, and so on. In fact, a student said to me one day after uh, Christmas break uh, that in her neighborhood she couldn't see anybody out playing. playing. She says, do kids play outside anymore? Uh, the answer is essentially no, they don't. Okay, and part of it is because they live on unsafe streets. I used to ride our bikes, you know, in our neighborhood uh, after Christmas here. Uh, basically, uh, your parents don't want you out because the only place to be when you're outdoors is out in a moving lane, and that doesn't work. And you don't want the sidewalk there because if you have, if you have a sidewalk, it's public. Anybody could walk there. And since we are absolutely afraid of one another, and we're afraid of another one because we've done each other in by making decisions like we did in the 1930s, <laughs> so we don't want you walking in our neighborhood, all right? So you have this disaggregation of community life. Now, if you were looking at an ecosystem in a watershed, that kind of disaggregation is the beginning of the death of everything in it. All right? This kind of behavior is the beginning of the death of what happens, uh, uh, the beginning of the death of the elements in our uh, human settlement patterns. It has to respond to the same laws as nature does. And we disaggregate like this uh, and become uh, a single organism that lives a private life, then you're not engaged and you're not propagating life with your interaction. This does not work, and you can prove it. Okay, another example. Uh, and the landscape to get with this, look at this monoculture of lawn, okay? 
uh, this isn't anything. All right? There's no measurable benefit under any circumstances of this kind of environment. Okay? Um, there's some other indicators that there's a difficulty. Uh, we did a study a few years ago, of uh, a comparative study of Vittoria Gasteiz and Syracuse, New York. Vittoria is in uh, northern Spain, capital of the Basque region. And uh, we were looking at population trends. And uh, uh, Vittoria has about uh, 230,000 people with the population rising. Syracuse has about 160,000 with the population dropping. Yet Syracuse and Onondaga County have that population of that declining population on probably 10 times the amount of actual land coverage for human settlement as it had 50 years ago. All right, again, less acreage, and, I'm sorry, more acreage and more energy per person. By having that greater land coverage for fewer people, you can only get the things by driving. Greater use of fossil fuel, greater emissions adding to global warming, uh, and, and it's the only way we can behave. <coughs> Any new person who moves to Onondaga County realizes that without a car, they can't function, you can't have a life. By the way, it hurts our students. A lot of the students in our program uh, were wondering why they're not getting their work done as well as they might. You know why? It's because they are working 30 hours a week in many cases to maintain what? The car they bought to bring to school. Right? When I was at Cornell as an undergrad, if you want financial aid, you couldn't have a car because they weren't going to fund your car. Okay? But a lot of students have to work. So you lose literally individually, the environment loses, community loses in the way that we uh, have structured our communities. How, yeah, how many of you have a car? Wow. If you're making the payments on the car and the insurance, and any of you, especially if you're male under 25, insurance is, is, is you know, uh, is highway robbery. Uh, you know, if you had the money, that money you were putting into the car payment and the insurance, your life would actually be much easier but I'm sure almost every one of you feels that you couldn't have a normal life as you think of it as being structured without that car. And that's, that's a problem. We have other indications that we have uh, you know, hit a new low uh, in how we deal with human settlement patterns. Um, this is how much water per person per year is used by citizens of Victoria Gestes, which is a modern city in a first world country that exports money, advice, and peacekeeping troops. Okay, so we're not talking about comparing, comparing to the third world nation. Per person, <coughs> per year in Syracuse, New York. What in the world are we doing with that resource? Yes? What made you choose the, that city, and I forgot the name of it, but... Victoria. Yeah, what made you choose that as opposed to any other city in a developed nation? It was presented to us by, by faculty at the Polytechnic University of Madrid as being Spain, Spain's most sustainable city. Uh, it also... Uh, um, has a unique group called the Center for Environmental Studies that is a not-for-profit group that has 20 years of experience in being an advisor to local government and local government actually listens to them. Okay, one other indicator. The amount of electricity used per person <coughs> per year by the citizens of Victoria, the amount of electricity used by, I guess it's electricity and gas, uh, used by the citizens of Syracuse per person per year. Again, what in the world are we doing? Yes. What's the climate in uh, Victoria versus Syracuse? Uh, Victoria's climate uh, without the sea. Victoria's climate uh, is probably similar to the kind of climate you have in downstate New York. So it has a real winter, not brutal, but it's real. And, uh, you know, so it's cold November through March, at least. Uh, it snows a little bit. It's also green. Okay, it's not the Spain you think of, like, like looking at uh, Castillo or La Mancha or something like that. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a, a green part of the country uh, on, towards the northwest coast. Uh, it has, lake, uh, well, not lake effect, but uh, ocean effect uh, weather. It's cloudy a lot. It rains a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, so we're not dealing with a place that is uh, um, the equivalent of, uh, you know, South Florida or Arizona or any of those kinds of, you know, whether arid or moist tro subtropical climates. Uh, it has four seasons. Okay. Um, the next, uh, what I'm going to try to do is go through a couple of case studies of looking at how urban areas have engaged in this process of, uh, of addressing uh, sustainability. But before I do that, I also want to give you some, some indications as to what kinds of things we think sustainability is about. Um, I put together, and I will give a copy to Professor Hall to Xerox for you, and you can read this carefully at, at your leisure. Uh, you know, beyond today, 
Um, but we're putting together a draft framework for a sustainable Syracuse. Uh, and this is part of a comprehensive plan uh, process that the city is now engaged in. And ESF has contracted with the city to help them through this process. And what we have done is make the argument that the traditional um, foundation for doing a comprehensive plan, which is usually the principles of economic development, that that is inherently unsustainable. Because that economic development process, which is fundamental to capitalism, because that's, that's who we are, requires that you use up your resources. And then you move on to the next resource, and you use that up. And that's because we have to have more and better annually <coughs> to break even. Right? And you, you, can, you, know, you can meet the basics of economics and figure out why that's the case. But what we've said to, uh, to people in the city here is, is that there are that the city, rather than being based on economic development fundamentals, needs to be based on an attitude towards symbiosis. And that there are some elements here that they need to, uh, to be very cognizant of. So this draft framework for sustainability talks about functionality. This refers to the strength of interaction among components, systems, and processes in contributing to the ability of the Earth's atmosphere to support life. Right? And what we're saying here is that the city has to actually function in such a way as to not continually diminish the life around it, but to actually in, engage and support the, the, the enhancement of natural life as well as civic life in and around uh, its, uh, it, its environments. Um, we ask that uh, uh, we, we talk about efficiency. And by that we, uh, we mean uh, again, using the ecological definition. This refers to the ability of communities to transfer the maximum amount of energy into useful work for themselves and the surrounding systems to which they are linked. Now, you all know that when you have the lack of densification in a human community, all those roads, water, sewers, cables, and pipes and whatnot, the fewer addresses they have on them, paying for them, the less efficient that they are. All right? We've been in a minor tax revolt uh, since the Reagan administration began in 1980, and everybody thinks it's because of welfare mothers and uh, you know things of that sort. That is not your problem. It is the taxes that you pay for living separate from your neighbor in such a way that the costs of all urban infrastructure can only go up. And the pattern in suburbanization is you move to a suburb and you pay low taxes because it's a cornfield. Then you put up all this housing. Housing doesn't pay for itself tax-wise. Housing costs the town money, right? Because they have to provide services, water, sewer, roads, school district, and so on. The last bus has to get the last kid up in the last corner of the valley, okay? So then your taxes go up, and you foot the bill. Nine years later, you decide you're going to sell and buy up and go to the next town out, and you will repeat the process, okay? And then, you know, if you really have no luck, you'll end up in Fort Myers, Florida in retirement, uh, looking at a bunch of other people who fled the north and wonder, where am I? Okay? So, uh, you know, but that's what we mean by efficiency, all right? Um, we also uh, ask the city to be cognizant of diversity, all right? In any, and again, you know this intuitively, in any environment, human or natural, there has to be a diversity of elements in order to make it better than the sum of its parts in order to uh, supply the kinds of uh, new energies that help the system respond to stresses, whether the economic stresses or the stresses of uh, you know, earthquake or forest fire or anything else. So um, this refers to the value of species variety as an agent of enriched community interaction in, times, in terms of the increased opportunities for systemic generation and the ability to withstand disruption. All cities have to be able to do this. All human settlements have to be able to do this. Many suburban subdivisions, you know, uh, if one thing is in decline, there's nothing else to bolster it up because there's nothing else going there. So if housing fails, it's the end of it. Okay. Uniqueness in ecology. This refers to the ability of communities to be particularly responsive to their immediate environment and hence variable in the way they behave and or interact with other communities in similar to similar locations. We see if I can simplify this that in any ecosystem, there are elements there that make that system or parts of that system uniquely able to, to respond to some other life form or process that is nearby. And in cities, this is something that can be described this way. Syracuse, New York has uh, the University Hill District, okay? So pick, pick a university city, which is distinct from many other kinds of cities. That is a, uh, a, a generator of life and activity and processes that gives it a unique opportunity 
to, uh, to generate more life activity and processes in a way that a city without a university cannot. All right? In other kinds of cities, it might be something else. Uh, you know, a stadium, uh, a pr prolific manufacturing uh, uh, district, or something else. But uh, every system has to recognize its, uh, its uniqueness and what it can do. Um, resiliency. In ecology, this refers to the ability of communities to marshal the forces of functionality, efficiency, diversity, and uniqueness, all the things that precede us here, to restore their original components and structures, or to take on adaptive morphologies, meaning new physical forms, in response to cata uh, cataclysmic disturbance. All right? So basically, as, as, we, as we go through these elements of, of, of symbiosis, what we're saying is these are all the building blocks that allow the living community to withstand uh, being buffeted about and having disruptions, the kinds of things that would kill these environments if these environments operated in a sense of disaggregation. Right? Because that's what sustains life, your ability to respond to these, uh, these pressures. And then finally, what we want to have is an equilibrium, and that goes back to being the, uh, the shifting steady state mosaic. So these are the kinds of conversations that we are having with city leaders here in Syracuse. It's driving them nuts, and it's driving us nuts that it's driving them nuts. Okay? Uh, but it's a discussion that we continue to have, and we hope that this will be the basis for um, the, uh, the resuscitation of the city as a living, ecologically sound form. Now, what I want to do is take a few minutes and go through some case studies that uh, can show you how cities are successfully dealing with this business of remaining environmentally sound uh, and sustainable places. Um, in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a great uh, movement in American cities to define their skylines in very, very prominent ways through a, a, what we call kind of a process of gigantism. Uh, the World Trade Centers in their former and less famous uh, format, uh, you know, were kind of the primary example of that. There are others uh, in Los Angeles or uh, Atlanta. Um, and what these cities were trying to do is get a strong sense of physical identity by building lots of skyscrapers in downtowns, whether downtowns were viable or not. Um, the city of Philadelphia did not do that. Uh, in fact, the city of Philadelphia had uh, what many people considered a uh, rather brown bag and pedestrian uh, <coughs> idea about what downtown ought to be. But the, the logic behind it was uh, involved a couple of things. Uh, and this, is, this, this, these, this pair of buildings here is a good example of what the city's trying to do. They didn't want a developer to come in and corner the market on one site and then have service parking at street level next door. What they wanted was for the developer to feel they had to buy two sites and hence give coverage uh, 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 to the city's uh, um, uh, landscape and preclude service parking and make it so that you had a dense city that in, where everything interacted with everything else in a more efficient way. Um, that was helped by the fact that you had a fantastic, and still have, a fantastic public transit system that makes up for the fact that parking is not uh, uh, offered as, uh, as well as it might be uh, in, in downtown Philadelphia. But then a developer came along and said that they wanted to do something unique. And by the way, the reason you could maintain coverage of every parcel downtown is because Philadelphia had a height limit on buildings. Nobody could build higher than 545 feet. That forced development to spread out within the downtown's confines and take up these parcels. A new developer came along and decided that he was going to go uh, uh, higher than that. And he was allowed to because the, the height limit was not a legal height limit, it was a gentleman's agreement. The planning director took every developer to dinner or lunch, and after the meal, they all agreed to the height limit. Uh, it was Edmund Bacon, he was a dynamic force, he's in his 90s now. Kevin Bacon, the actor, okay, it's his dad. Uh, and it's a family of jazz musicians, actors, and architects, and uh, they're a pretty persuasive crew. And so, anyhow, this developer comes in and says, uh, you know, that uh, he wants to go above the height limit, and there was a lot of fear in the city that that was going to begin this process of gigantism, and you'd end up with the giant towers and lots of surface, surface parking among them. The other issue had to do with a sense of what the city thought itself as being. Uh, it was, you know, a Quaker city, uh, designed by William Penn originally, and, um, and a city that uh, felt that it stood for something. Right? And uh, the city, uh, it has the largest city hall in the United States, and that city hall with William Penn's statue on it was symbolic of a philosophy about how to live. A lingering Quaker philosophy uh, that has to do with how you treat your neighbor, how you treat hard work, 
uh, how you treat your sense of intellectual and moral development, and, uh, and about being a community better than the sum of its parts. This is the only city that actually spent a year consciously resisting billions in reinvestment because it had a philosophy about who they were, uh, and that philosophy had nothing to do with cash. Okay. Uh, oops. Go back a step here. Okay. Penn's original city. Delaware River on the east, Schuylkill River on the west, grazing pastures for people whose cattle lived in their houses, and the main public square, which is now where City Hall is. And there's been an attempt since literally 1682 to make that essentially the confines of downtown, and it has largely worked. Okay? I keep going one thing ahead here. Okay? Uh, this is William Penn's statue on top of City Hall, and the height limit is at his feet. That's 545 feet above the city. So, anyway, um, one of the issues had to do with the fact that uh, also the view shed of City Hall would be cut off if skyscrapers could be built anywhere, and hence that symbol of the kind of city you were would be lost. So, the city had to, uh, this is still looking down that corridor, and now at the other end of the corridor, uh, where the art museum is, so the city had to make an innovative response because it could not legally stop the development from going above the height limit. And by the way, he's going to do it with two towers, not just one. Um, by the way, the extent to which the city has in a sense of how to take care of itself in, the, in, in terms of conservation, you're looking out over the core area of Fairmont Park. Everything you see is still in the city limits. All right? That great forest out there is Fairmont Park. Um, there's about 4,500 4, acres in the core area, and the Fairmont Park Commission administers about 12,000 acres altogether. So the city then decided, okay, you can go ahead and break the height limit since it's legal to do so, but we're going to backfill with the plan for center city, and we're going to limit where skyscrapers can go. And so they created a skyscraper district, and every area, every <coughs> building you see that is in gray is in a place where um, the skyscrapers are allowed to go beyond the traditional height limit. Uh, it's about six blocks wide and about 20 blocks long as it goes east to west. Um, and this is looking at the east side of downtown now. And that was going to rein in uh, you know, where these things were going to be built. While making this decision, they also, and this is what it looks like when it gets built, okay? This is City Hall. All right, and these are the buildings that were allowed to break the height limit. Um, they should have had design guidelines to prevent it putting ears on buildings, but they didn't, <laughs> they didn't do that. Um, so they're there. So the view shed of City Hall, particularly along the corridor of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, uh, you know, was retained. And hence that sense of that symbolic sense of what Philadelphia is about collectively has been retained. And then they decided to throw into this plan other uh, aspects of planning that would also maximize in a dense way the use of urban land in the downtown districts. So along the Schuylkill River, uh, leading over to the former uh, Pennsylvania Railroad main train station now for Amtrak. Uh, again, you know, infill uh, development here. Um, New, uh, new development at uh, uh, Logan Square, one of Penn's original squares. Um, the, uh, uh, the development of new office buildings uh, in downtown, in fact, within the confines of the, uh, uh, of the uh, skyscraper district. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Uh, new hotels uh, and convention space. Uh, City Hall as a, uh, as, as a festival marketplace, as well as as a political center. Okay. Uh, and the development of, the, of Penn's Landing's waterfront, uh, and much of that has now taken place. In fact, much of this has taken place in general. But here's the other innovative thing. The city of Philadelphia, uh, through its government and through its citizens negotiating about how to handle this massive new infusion of, uh, of development, we're looking again at, but how do we again generate new life and processes to keep our city alive and in good condition so that it remains better than some of its parts? So they made a political decision and a legal decision that all of the taxes collected in the skyscrapers that went above 545 feet, all the taxes collected in the rentable space above 545 feet was to be reinvested in the city's neighborhoods. Okay? So that kept the money in the city and that kept the money generating new life, new, new activity, and new processes. This is a sustainable urban process. Right? The cash isn't in London, it's not in Tokyo, it's not in suburban Philadelphia. Those tax dollars get reinvested in these neighborhoods and you begin to get revitalization that, uh, you know, by hook and crook starts to look like this. Renovated housing, uh, in, new infill construction, uh, 
uh, new places for the working class to be and for the middle class to be, um, you know, and uh, uh, you know, new public investment in streetscapes. Uh, new shopping districts and new partnerships. For example, this is a middle school uh, in, in North Philadelphia, and this is the, uh, <coughs> the botanical garden and arboretum to which uh, uh, the private sector came in and working with the school district built and it's a study area for the kids. And then you get other partnerships. Temple University, uh, with in, in part with a lot of money supplied by one of its famous graduates, Bill Cosby. Uh, has been systematically working with the city of Philadelphia, uh, and it's, a, it's really a, quite a foundation effort, as well as using university money, to, uh, to buy up property, restore it, and the university puts in public facilities, certainly for sports, recreation, and education, but also uh, they take a lot of old row housing and renovate it and make it student housing, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then they monitor you know, the, the quality of that. So uh, what has happened then is with these taxes collected above 545 feet, the city has been able to interact with the private sector, the public, the other aspects of the public sector, with its citizens to revitalize the pieces of its mosaic that were decaying, and to begin to bring them back to life. Okay, so um, you know, just a simple case study of, of of adhering to these principles, and maybe I should stop here. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful talk, wonderful for this class. And